So the European Policy Institute from Skopje has just finished uh, the conducting of the first ever deliberative polling project in Macedonia. Um, as we've learned, the concept was first described by um, Professor James Fishkin from Stanford University, who is sitting right next to me, in mm -hmm. 1988. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us a bit more as to the main benefits of the deliberative polling as a methodology? Well, most of the time, in most countries, uh, most citizens are not thinking in depth about public policy issues. So I asked a very simple question. What would the people think if they really engaged in um, considering the arguments for and against uh, some important policy? Uh, and ordinary polls don't tell you that uh, because the people aren't actually focused. They're, um, uh, if you have one vote in millions, why should you spend a lot of time and effort thinking about the complexities of some policy issue like the conditions under which Macedonia should join the EU or not, um, or some other complicated question? Uh, Democracy is supposed to have some connection between the will of the people and what's actually done. But most of the time, uh, the people aren't really engaged to think about it. Some people think that indicates that the people aren't capable of it. I am, after uh, projects all over the world, fully confident that the public is very capable. It's just most time, most of the time, most people think their voice doesn't matter. Why should they pay a lot of attention? So this hypothetical, this very simple hypothetical becomes important because if you can actually measure it, you can bring it to bear on policy discussions and you can understand what the people would want and why. What are the reasons that have weight with the public when they really focus on an issue? What are the reasons that don't have weight what are the things they would accept and for what reasons? What are the things they wouldn't accept and for what reasons? So this seemingly philosophical question is eminently practical if you actually care about democracy. So we've been doing this now in 28 countries uh, and um, I think uh, about 107 cases uh, in very different kinds of countries, some very developed countries like the, uh, the United States or even European-wide or the United Kingdom, some very um, some developing countries, uh, five countries in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, Ghana, Uganda, Senegal, uh, Tanzania, um, most recently Malawi. Uh, uh, in Asia, Japan, uh, even China at the local level, Mongolia, uh, Latin America, Brazil, Argentina. So in all of these different kinds of countries, different kinds of contexts, different issues, sometimes issues that are very uh, uh, contentious, where people uh, are very emotional, sometimes issues that are highly complex and seemingly technical, but where we can see the basic value trade-offs for involved in doing one thing or another. And all over the world, we find that the public's actually pretty smart. And uh, we don't have the data yet here in Macedonia, but I will bet that that will be the case here, that the public, whatever it decides on these issues, will be very thoughtful. They will have reasons. Uh, for uh, and they will have expressed the reasons both in the um, questionnaires and in the, the taped uh, the transcripts from the tapes and the small groups. As you mentioned, uh, through the Center for Deliberative Democracy, you've carried out this project, this types of project in um, 28 countries. Mm -hmm. So, could you tell us a bit more about the different outcomes um, from these? Uh, from the deliberative polling in the different countries? 
sometimes there are uh, major uh, policy outcomes that flow directly from the projects. Mm -hmm. In Texas, we did a lot of projects on energy choices, which led Texas uh, to become the leading state in the United States in the amount of wind power when when they when we started they were out of the 50 states last and now they're first so that was an important um, uh, effect on the environment uh, in uh, Bulgaria we did a project about the uh, condition of the Roma uh, where at the time the uh, Roma were um, in uh, segregated schools, Roma-only schools. And we showed that the public would accept integration of the Roma children in the, um, in the schools for the broader society and even supported busing the Roma children into the other schools. And I'm told by our Bulgarian partners that that was an important early step in the process by which the schools have been desegregated. In Japan, we did a project on the reform of the pension system, and the government was just about to privatize the pension system. But when the people of Japan in a national project in microcosm thought about the risks of putting their pensions in the stock market, the support for the privatization fell in half from, I don't know, something like 70% to something like 29%. And, um, but the support increased for taxes, uh, consumption tax that would uh, support the pension system. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what the government ended up doing. Uh, we also did the um, energy choices for the Japanese government with our Japanese partner. Everything we do in other countries is with a local partner. So we have a, a local partner in Japan who did the, uh, uh, the energy choices after, Fukushi after the Fukushima disaster. In Mongolia now, the, um, the government has actually passed a law requiring deliberative polling for constitutional change. And uh, we've just, uh, working with the, our, our friends in Mongolia, completed a national deliberative poll on changing the constitution, which is now required by law. And the parliament is now considering the results of a, for, about a, for a constitutional amendment on very big issues about how the constitution could be changed. So we've done a lot of different uh, projects in different countries with our local, we offer technical support and advice as we've done here with, uh, with local institutions, so. So we've spent the past um, two days discussing and deliberating um, on the democratic reforms and the economic reforms in the context of Macedonia's integration in the EU. So my last question to you would be, what are your impressions um, for the event that we've had in Macedonia? And how do you think it went and um, what you might expect out of it? Well, we don't have the data, <laughs> but my impressions are very favorable in terms of the, uh, we're very happy to be working with, with uh, such a uh, competent NGO. And uh, I was impressed by the, the moderators, by the organization, by the recruitment of the sample, by the substance of the discussions, by the um, outreach. I thought you had an excellent television partner. Uh, and uh, so I'm, uh, uh, waiting to see the, the data so that we can look at a, uh, uh, the data, both quantitative and qualitative, so we can really understand uh, what happened. But I'm sure it will be very interesting. I never prejudge until I see the data, so we can't say. But I think that, that uh, I have no doubt that the energy and excitement that I sensed in the uh, small groups was um, uh, indicates that there was a lot of um, deliberation going on. So I think you should be very happy. We are, we are. Well, thank you very much, Professor Fishkin. My pleasure. <laughs>